Make sure better. Let's first review the notation and the first lecture I gave yesterday. So we start with a Rorm polynomial. Uh, let's just assume the coefficients are uh, patient middle lifting already. So we have, have this convex polytope, and then the completion of the convex polytope in one dimension higher. And we have this cone generated by delta bar and then the lattice points in m plus one dimension of space. And then let's define this Banach-Hypothetic uh, Banach algebra error. So here, there are two versions. You can use a version where the coordinates go to zero, or you can use a version coordinates doesn't it goes, does not go to zero. Um, and here, I just use a version where the formal basis, given by infinite combination of the basis elements pi to u0 x to u. All right. So that's the uh, definition of the Pirabana space. And you also remember, I defined the Fubis map yesterday. So first, I have this power series, which is a multiplication of the power series and then composed with the Fubis inverse operator. This one is tau inverse. And if I iterate this a time, where q is p to the a, I get actually a linear operator. <coughs> and I said this actually is a compact operator, and so the trace and determinant are defined and actually entire. Now here's a proof of the, the compact operator. So with respect to this basis, then you compute this map, the semi-linear one, first the semi-linear one, so you have this infinite matrix, and you find this infinite matrix has a very nice shape. And uh, so each one, this AIG actually is a finite matrix, where the number of row is just this. Uh, uh, so AIG will be the, has the LI rows, LJ column. The LI is just number of last points in I times delta. This will be the number of last points in J times delta. So that's like the Hodge filtration. So whenever you are in such a situation, then if, because this one, we're not really computing the determinant of, the, of this matrix. We're really computing the matrix of that linear operator. So you have to iterate this one, you get more complicated matrix. But that is still uh, compact. Because this one is compact, when you iterate, then it's still compact. And uh, so that shows it is an uh, entire function. Just work, works just like a finite matrix, ex except you have a power series instead of a polynomial. And uh, in fact, the, the shape of this uh, Hodge filtration immediately gives you actually a lower bound for this uh, entire function. So from the, this uh, Hodge filtration, you, you immediately get this uh, proposition. Uh, so, so the quadratic Newton polygon of this entire function is greater or equal to or lies above this polygon. This sort of the chain level Hodge polygon, which is given by uh, the polygon in R two in the plan with vertices. So the first coordinates will be the sum of the this number. So we call L K, say, K up to zero to n. The second one will be for each L K just multiplied by K to M. And where M varies from zero to one. So if you do a picture, then this, this, this polygon is just OK. You have a polygon. The first side has the slope. OK, you have a polygon. Slope 0, slope 1, slope 2, slope 3. 
this one is slope zero, slope one, slope two, slope three, three, slope four. And you look at the horizontal projection. And the first one will be just A of zero, which is one. And then you have A of one, A of two, A of three. So this is sort of the lower bound. So there, your Newton particle is actually lies under or above. So it could be, you know, your Newton particle could be something like this. So that, that's the relation. In fact, this relation is already very useful to determine the slope of the L function. In fact, my, my, my proof actually works on the chain level. So I use this uh, kind of uh, <laughs> infinite determinant. OK, so now how this uh, entire function relates to the L function, or the zeta function, which we were interested in from the beginning. End point? Uh, no. The initial point is to meet. End points they don't have to meet. L is a, L of I is the number of uh, large points in I times delta intersect with uh, Z to them. So this also occurred in the first lecture this morning. Actually, I use a different notation, but just to be compatible with uh, the first lecture, just change to L. In, in my uh, notes on the web, I use WI. The weight. I guess the number of large points on the ice layer of this uh, delta bar. Okay. Good. And it's actually uh, this entire function uh, is a pretty good power series. What can, what can you say about the reciprocal zero of this one? It turns out this one actually the, the zero of the reciprocal zero of the, this power series, they are all algebraic integer, in fact. And in fact, they're all weight number. This, of course, is not obvious from by looking at that such a complicated periodic power series and uh, using complicated uh, map. And this, uh, okay, this re follows from the relation or the work trace formula. Right? Okay, so next. Uh, I'll start with a work trace formula. Remember, we were interested in c computing this uh, exponential sum over the torus, m plus one torus. And now we have this uh, linear operator compact operator. So if we iterate case power, that's also linear. And the actual has a trace. So what is the relation between these two numbers? Of course, they cannot be equal. But they're almost equal. Um, they're equal up to this trivial factor. So that's a very beautiful and simple relation. This is a, a dual trace formula. So basically, if you know the sum, then you know the trace. If you know the trace, you know the sum. They determine each other. Now, of course, there, it's not clear how the sum vary with k. However, it's very clear how it varies with k. It comes from the same operator, just iterated to the k's power. And if you sum this one, OK, so if you expand this one, of course, you get this uh, binomial expansion. to the ki trace. Right. Now you substitute into the definition of this L function, which is the exponential, and then sigma, k to k over k, and then your sequence. Substitute into this one, and you get this uh, formula. So you get this formula. Then the sum becomes a product. <coughs> C 
sigma k from 1 to infinity. to the k. And then let me put a q to the i here and it'll be a put the prime sign here, k is power. And we have a reason for this power. Hmm. What? Uh, trace. That's right. Trace of this one. Trace of the whole thing. So, by the way, this formula is actually not very difficult to prove once you once you have set up all the notation. Basically, just uh, sum and compute it. Like you, you can prove it in a few lines. So, and then, of course, using the well-known relation between the determinant and the trace, you can rewrite this as a Product of determinant. This will be determinant one minus p q to the uh, i v a <coughs> So of course here uh, I've taken one negative one into this formula. So that's the uh, this is the multiplicative form of the drug trace formula. That is the additive form of the drug trace formula. These are equivalent to these two. So as a collateral ray, you immediately get the analytic continuation of this L function. Because we know each one, each determinant, is a purely entire function. So when you change a variable, shift into the still entire function, and take an order related product, so you get a meromorphic function. So collateral ray, you get this. Yes. Periodic meromorphic function I mean, in T. So this is actually the, the, the key step of Dwork's uh, rationality proof. Now once you have this part, and then you use a, another well-known rationality lemma that forces the L function has to be a rational function. So, so we know this one is a power series with uh, integer coefficients. So suppose you have a power series with integer coefficients. How do you know it's a rational function? And there's a criteria which tells you how, when it is rational function. So then it's rationality proof. So there's a lemma. Suppose you have a power series. Let's say you start with a power series with integer coefficients. Then you want to know when this power series is a rational function. So of course, to be a rational function, uh, this is the power series. To be a rational function, it must be analytic at the origin. So the first one is GT is analytic uh, near zero, at zero, actually, let's say at zero. Uh, in the complex plane. If you use this as a complex function, it must be analytic at one point. If it's not analytic at the origin, then this is apparently cannot be a rational function. And second, if, if you view it periodically for some p, of course, rational function is certainly meromorphic for every p, including the complex number, for some p. So that's even only if, of course, one direction, this direction is trivial. Uh, so the other direction just using a recursive criterion. Okay, now we know this uh, L function is a uh, pitkin meromorphic. 
And now we actually know it has a positive radius of convergence. So therefore, this gives a theorem of Dwork. The L function is a rational function. And therefore, the zeta function is also a rational function. Because it differs just by uh, zeta function torus, which is a very simple rational function. Okay, so that finished the first part uh, of my lecture about the rationality proof of the data function and L function. And this is, we do not assume any conditions, so F is a complete arbitrary. But if you want to say more, then to compute more, you have to uh, assume some sort of condition. Uh, so next, so basically this proof actually works on the chain level and then, then use this rationality lemma that forces it to be rational. <coughs> It does not, does not actually explain why it is rational, but it forces it to be rational. So if you want to explain it's rational, then you want to have some sort of cohomologic formula. And then so next, I want to discuss this PDK cohomologic formula. So to, uh, to get the cohomologic formula, we need to define a complex and define the, the boundary operator. So how do we define the complex? We start with uh, defining a new function. Remember, we have this uh, power series, which is the key to define a full means operator. And then we just multiply that's conjugate full bit. <coughs> so this is an union product. And this is actually a formal power series. So this is a formal power series. But uh, the coefficients may not go to zero now. So that is sort of a formal power series. Now, what's the relation between, and of course, the G and F, they solve from each other. So equivalently, this is, you can write F, capital F, as a quotient of this G divided by G tau x to the P. So we can define G using this relation, and then you, you just iterate the solve G, and I'll give you this infinite product. Once you find a G, then you get the quotient give you your, your f. Remember, what is my precise p? The form is inverse operator. Acting on monomial is just the inverse, just x p over u, if p divides u, zero, if p does not divide u. Okay? So, and there's a map which is uh, important for the trace data function, L function is this composition of say p and this uh, capital F. Now, you your F is now formally of that form, G of X, G of tau, X, P. So formally, so what is Pusai P? Pusai P is tau inverse. So Pusai P is tau inverse that will kill this tau, and we will remove the piece power. So this would be just exactly G, X, inverse to say P, this composition of, of uh, map. So formally, my phi one is just uh, the conjugate of this uh, say P with this uh, formal power series G, for G depends on our little f. On the other hand, of course, my G actually does not act on my Balaha space as, as delta. However, the total result after you come after the composition, it, it is actually uh, stable on the, the bond algebra. Yeah. Okay, and then well, once it's in, in this form of conjugate form, then to iterate, you just iterate to the percent Q, the percent P, the eighth power.
This is this would be linear map. Okay, so then next we want, also want to define the differential operator. That's for integer. We have n plus one variable x zero to x n. So we define the differential operator to be the same conjugate. Just conjugate everything by G. And then this is the user differential operator, logarithmic poses G of X. So therefore, uh, okay, and of course, because this guy commutes with each other, so the conjugate, formal conjugate also commute with each other. So DI, DJ, DJ. And this one also almost commute with this uh, map. What's the relation? How the di compose with my phi a? The almost com commute that's just different by a scalar. So that, those are the relations. Of course, to check the relation, you only get to check the relation between this uh, user differential operator and uh, this, say, Q, because everything is conjugate formally. Okay, and all this acts on my Banach algebra. Here. So when, whenever you have a commutative ring, you have a set of a commuting. Uh, differential operators, so you can construct a complex. Okay, so the same way. So you can construct the Kazua complex. Associated to this uh, ring uh, with this commuting differential operator. So that gives you this uh, same as delta T. This boundary operator depends on this uh, this differential operator that has been defined uh, in the first lecture yesterday or today. It has been defined. But now we have not just a complex; we actually have a Fermi map that's important for for zeta function. If, if you only know the complex, then that that, that does not tell you anything about the uh, zeta function. So we have to know the map. So. So the map of this complex what is this map? Here would be just the, my phi a. That's a linear map. And here would be the same as phi a except uh, multiplied by q. And here the same as phi a except multiplied by q to the n. Q to the n plus one. Yeah. All right. Now, because uh, you have this, you know, because we multiply this power of Q, and this relation shows this like commutes. So this is actually a, a map of the chain complex. <coughs> and therefore, we cannot rewrite the L function. What is our L function? So remember my L function, I move, move negative one n's power to this side. This is a, this is a big dual trace formula. T, Q to the I, 
que errei. I can rest up if you want. And uh, negative one i. E plus one choose i. So you see, the, for, for the i's factor, this determinant raised to this power is exactly the determinant of this uh, i's piece here. So when you take the water latent product, then you can pass, because it's commutes, you can pass to cohomology level. I'll give you the formula. of this complex. Okay, so that is a cohomological formula. Now, of course, if you know this is a finite dimensional, now you explain this rational function. I think this would follow from the the finite dimensionality of bridge the cohomology. So that gives you sort of a, a new proof of rationality, which is much harder. What is the convergent? Uh, what does convergent mean? What, in what sense? What are you? Yeah, yeah. 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 So when the coefficient is going to zero, one doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Now, what do you first prove the, the case where the coefficient is going to zero, then you take completion? Because once it's finite dimensional, when you complete, so you get the same. You get the same. So th that's a general formula. This, of course, this formula also does not assume uh, f is a delta regular. But f, f is regular. Then you can actually calculate the cohomology. Homology. S delta Q sigma and furthermore this one H0 is a free ZQ pi module of rank the degree Delta, which is just n factorial times the volume. <laughs> volume is different. This is a factor of this volume. <laughs> Normalized volume. So how do you prove the basically first my battery reflector he showed this is true when you replace the S delta by this polynomial algebra error, and when your operator di is replaced by this capital Fi, which is sort of a partial derivative. And of course, my operator di is very different from his operator. Uh, it's actually an infinite sum. It's an infinite power series, this operator. But it turns out uh, the main term is the same as his, his uh, capital Fi. So the other term orders the many term, and they actually just per perturbate a little bit, and then you can show the little term controls this, this whole thing. And then, of course, you also have to show that it, in better of the case where the coefficients are algebra actually over a finite field. So you have to lift to P dig, and you show that lifting works. If, if this holds a modulo pi, module, then it holds without modulo pi as well. And furthermore, this actually this this is a free uh, module over ZQ pi, not just over the quotient field. So this is actually stronger than the, the torsion. All right, so now if you plug in this result into here, you, you see everything 
disappear except the case i equal to zero. So if i equal to zero, then you get a, this will be a polynomial. So from now on, we assume f is regular. Then the previous calculations show you get the form of the cell function, which is the determined item which is zero. And this is a polynomial with integer coefficients. Because we know this is the power series with integer coefficients. We know this side is a polynomial. So this is the polynomial with integer coefficients of d3. We have delta. Actually, the previous calculation only tells the degree is less or equal to degree delta because the, the math may have a singular determinant could be zero. Then you, you can show actually the determinant uh, the map is a tensor with a Q, it is invertible. So therefore the degree has to be exactly D of delta. So that, that tells the, the, the shape of the data function or real function. And the next, what can we say about a zero? So if you, we factor this polynomial, in terms of the, so it has d delta roots. So these roots will be algebraic integer. So you view them in a complex number. So you can, you can ask what is the observer? Then w i r phi, there's a weight number, weight integer, so the weight, let's say, is denoted by the weight is wi, and the wi has to be in z, in this part. I think initially this was proved by, uh, this mixed result was proved by Adelson Sperber for large p, and then Denis uh, Rosario the, used the Ehrlich method to prove that this holds for all p. Uh, but I think you can now, once you have this cohomology calculation, then you can also directly use, use catalyzers to deduce this mixed result. So without using any analytic cohomology. So basically, this is a mixed uh, weight up to m plus 1. So you can ask a further question, what is this, uh, the pieces of this, uh, the, the, the pure, pure pieces? So let's say we define, say EJ is a number of uh, i is between 1 and the d of delta such that the weight equal to j. So we know the weight is some things between 0 up to plus 1. So EJ just count the number of uh, roots with weight j. Then we want to determine precisely what is the ej. Of course, we know the sum ej equals the number of roots with d of delta. We want to precisely what is each ej. I would think this is probably some sort of the, the uh, hot number hpq, which you mentioned in uh, Bradford's talk which, as he said, is a very complicated uh, combinatorial description. And uh, then if Lozard determines this number using the combinatorial, very complicated combinatorial description, which, in fact, uh, it's not clear how to compute it in higher dimensional case. If somebody give you, actually give you a family, it's not clear how to do it. So to be, Compatible with uh, 
the Newton plug, which I, I will be discussing later on. So I want to define a weight polygon, which basically consists of this number. So I define the weight polygon of delta just to be this one. Instead of given the rigorous definition, just draw the picture. So, so this would be slope 0, 1, 2, 3. And the lens, horizontal lens, so this would be E0, which would be E1, E2. Basically, I want to package this number into a polygon. Of course, in this case, one can easily show E0 is always 1. So therefore, to determine this uh, uh, number EJ, you only need to desc describe this weight polygon. Okay, maybe the weight polygon is denoted by the weight polygon of delta. This polygon, put just a notation there. So what is the uh, and Nocera, they, they showed that this weight polygon of delta can be determined in a very complicated combinatorial way. In the orphan application, it may be easier to prove it directly than using that formula. Okay, I want to write on one formula, which, which is their case. One case we, which the formula is very explicit and, and uh, reasonably easy to calculate. So it's the case where delta is a simplex. If delta is a simplex, then you have a nice formula. And let's say zero to be one and ci to be the sum of all the face of delta its dimension to i minus one. And, uh, okay, this is a user volume, which is a rational number. <coughs> so, and then once you define these numbers, you can read off this EJ. The first one is always one. And the other one will be sigma So that's formula, and this is a uh, pretty formula for simplex. So as an exercise, maybe you can compute, let's say, this family. Uh, C, this is CJ. Right. Uh, CI, that's one. So suppose this is a delta regular, then you can try to compute this one. And even use formula actually, it's, it's, yeah, it's easy to make a mistake. Even, even this formula is very simple, it's easy to make a mistake for one of these EG. But anyway, this is computable, there's a very simple formula for this EG in this case. Therefore, the weight polygon is completely determined. Now next, I want to discuss the uh, Newton polygon. The periodic estimate, the slope of the zero. So remember my L function has a d delta roots. <coughs> now I view this as a periodic number. That means I factor this polynomial in the closure of a periodic number instead of the complex number. 
So I can look at its uh, slope. So the Q to the capital bar of this root, so I can write it as a Q to the minus SI. So the SI will be just uh, the power of Q divided SI. So SI is called a slope. Now this slope, the just rational number, and then in this interval, as I said previously, uh, SI may not be half an integer. This is just rational number. So given the, we want to determine the slopes. And for that matter, we also put them in, into a polygon to package them together. So if for real number S, I define H of S to be the number of uh, roots, number of roots such that the slope is equal to S. Well, this is a, for any rational number in this interval. Of course, if there's no such number, then that's just zero. And then the QADK Newton polygon will be just the polygon, same polygon, except, uh, uh, so for each S, I have a side of slope S where the horizontal length is just H of S. Now, if H of S equal to zero, that means there's no such side. So here will be slope zero, here will be H zero. So basically, this is the Newton polygon. I would just maybe use a shorter notation later on. I just call it the Newton polygon of this polynomial. Defined to be this polygon. So if you know this coding Newton polygon, that tells you exactly what all the slope. So the sum of this number equal to the total number of roots. So how do we determine the slope? The Newton polygon. Well, this question turns out to be uh, quite complicated because it's not completely determined by, by the combinatorial data. It's arithmetic in nature. So it depends uh, a lot on the arithmetic of the zeta function of f and also the prime number p. So what can, can I say about uh, this Newton polygon? But of course, once you know the L function, the, then you can immediately read up the Newton polygon. And if you know the L function, suppose you know everything. So the Newton polygon is, uh, is something finer than this uh, better number, hard number, but it's, of course, less information than the complete, the whole Z function. So suppose there's another definition of Newton polygon, which is, which is equivalent. So if we write our L function as polynomial in terms of coefficients, so polynomial of degree D of delta, so coefficient is M. So this M is an integer. Then Newton polygon of F is just the convex closure lower convex closure in R2 of these points of the, okay, of these points. So if you know the coefficients of the zeta function, which is integer, then you just compute these points in, in the prime, and you draw a lower convex closure that will give you the Newton polygon. So this is, a, this is a way to compute the Newton polygon. Once you're given the, you, of course, you're not going to factor the roots, compute the roots first, and then compute the slope. That, that would be 
more complicated. This, this is sort of a simpler way. Actually, this is the, the, the sort of definition in general, but I sort of reverse the definition. <coughs> So what, what does one know about this uh, Newton polygon? There's one general property one knows. Uh, the vertices of this Newton polygon has to be lots of points. So that gives you some restriction on Newton polygon. Because by definition, it's not clear because the, this could be rational number. The second one could be rational number. Because here I use Q. Of course, I use P, that's always integer. If I use Q, that could be, could be a rational number. So that's a one general property one knows about the Newton polygon. And there's, of course, some other general properties. So next general property is the relation to the Hodge number. So the Hodge number provides a lower bound for this Newton polygon. So remember our delta, let's say, it's n-dimensional, integral, convex polytope. And, uh, well, I use the LK. I use the WK. Let's just, let me just use WK instead of LK. Remember, this is the number of the last points in K times delta. And, uh, the generating series, this was uh, discussed in the first lecture today. <coughs> this is a rational function. This is Pankara series of this uh, great algebra S delta. This is of this from one minus t to the n plus one. And numerator is a polynomial of degree at most uh, n. And the coefficients are denoted by h k. So this h k would be the Hodge number. So I define the Hodge polygon of delta to be the polygon. So here's slope zero, one, two, three. The horizontal projection would be here will be H zero, and here will be H one. So of course the total sum equal to the delta. Now the hot polygon is a combinatorial invariant, depends only on your delta. It has nothing to do with the prime number P or, or the coefficient of the, the polynomial. And uh, as we see the slope are always integer, and we know that the slope of zeta function doesn't have to be integer, so there's no reason the, the Newton polygon, you could have the polygon in general. But one does know this Newton polygon always lies on or above the Hodge polygon. And in fact, with end points coincide. I mean, the proof is the same proof as I gave for the, for the, for the determinant, for, for, for the determinant. It's just uh, this, this Hodge filtration, then you complete the matrix of this shape, that, that more or less implies that. I mean, generally, there's always such a phenomenon as Newton polygon lies above Hodge. That, that's a general phenomenon. Okay. <coughs> so now let's discuss uh, uh, what can we say about the Newton polygon. So we know two general properties of the Newton polygon. One is the lattice point, the vertices, the lattice points. Another is uh, lies above this lower bound. So that implies for a given delta there are only infinite many possibilities for this Newton polygon. So because between this lower bound and this, this upper bound, trivial upper bound, the end points coincide. And the lattice points, the vertex has to be lattice points, so there are only infinite many possibility once you, for a given delta. And 
Of course, which part possibility will occur, which possibility doesn't occur, that's, that's very complicated. And to give a, an example, let me just to give an example. Let me just okay state. Uh, all right, maybe maybe I want to make make one definition called so called ordinal. So if the Newton polygon coincide with the Hardy polygon. Then we call F as ordinary. So basically, this means that this exactly the L function has exactly metric reciprocal root alpha i such that the slope equal to k. That's called a definition of ordinary. So we could ask uh, how often F is ordinary, or whether you can find a single ordinary point or not. If you're given polynomial with integer coefficients. So I will first discuss a harder question, which is there's essentially no results or very little results available. The variation of this Newton polygon with P, this is arithmetic variation. So here, there's sort of a general conjecture. Let's say you're given a polynomial, modern polynomial, with an integer or rational coefficient. It says delta regular or Q. Then it says there must have an implementing ordinary prime. The implementing P such that the Newton polygon of F reduced modulo P is ordinary. Of course, for small pieces, this may not be defined, but it seems this statement is for infinite many pieces, so that doesn't matter. We can just throw with first finite many p. And in fact, one can further ask, what is the density of ordinary prime? So you look at all the prime up to t, and uh, such that uh, f reduce modulo p is ordinary, compared with all the prime number, or T, and then you look at the uh, limit. Of course, this limit may not exist. So you could conjecture this limit exists, and in fact, it's positive. So the sort of positive density, not just the infinite many P. No. None at all. <laughs> not equal to be, uh, you know, if you look at the other <coughs> polygon which is above this uh, Hodge polygon, then you can ask the same question whether there are infinite many P, and if so, what the density. That, those I think would be more complicated to, to, to conjecture. This sort of the, the, the first approximation, because ordinary is supposed a little bit uh, occur more often, so it's, it's um, more accessible in a sense. What? Uh, that's right, the Lipper curve uh, case, which is what uh, the example I uh, discussed, in fact. So let's look at this family of the Lipper curve 
which is the color of your this family, let's say, suppose delta regular. So it's actually a lip curve in this case. <coughs> then in this case, you know the density, right, for the, for the ordinary point. The density is either one half or one. Depending on this, uh, F has a complex multiplication or not. So this this follow from there. So this was no much earlier. This is easier. So that's one evidence. It's higher dimensional. Uh, very difficult. So, one of, you, know, you, you could consider this more general kind of yaw, for instance, uh, f equal to this x1 plus xn plus 1 over this volume polynomial. It's a delta regular. I think if n is uh, four or more, then certainly there's nothing can be said whether, whether we can prove that it's actually a single ordinary prime or not. If you can prove that a single, a single one ordinary prime, then you remove that one, you can pro prove another one, then, we, then you prove infinite many. So we can't even prove a single ordinary prime. Of course, in, in practice, you can always, given case, you use a computer, then know <laughs> that you But theoretically, I mean, you really don't know how to prove a single ordinary plan. But maybe in the case in three such surface case, I don't know if that's realistic. Uh, it could be realistic to do. Case three surface in three. Sorry, I think well, what, what one know is, is the image of the Gower representation. If one knows that, uh, then using Chebotov density theorem with the Riemann hypothesis, that probably give you just like serious proof. For each fixed lambda, here lambda is actually a Russian number. Right, so what does it look like? I didn't compute it. Oh, didn't. I don't compute it myself. <laughs> I think it would be interesting to compute it, say, if it's a pattern. Uh, in terms of density, at least for this particular uh, family, compute for some lambda, you compute some numeric data, or say, what is the <coughs> density, possible density. Uh, okay, so that, that, that is, this uh, suggests the Newton part again. If I start with a polyorum polynomial with integer coefficients or rational coefficients, if let the p vary, then the problem is quite complicated. So next lecture, I will start with the easier problem. I will fix p, but I will let my coefficients vary. So it's geometric variation, where one knows more structural results and then later on, I will combine the geometric variation and the arithmetic variant. I will let both vary. First, geometric parameter variant, and then the p variant. That's sort of an intermediate where one can also say something. 